Good morning, everyone. My name is Adam Ferrand. I am a vice president of education, talent, leadership development here at Partnership Gwinnett. We're so glad you joined us this morning for this webinar on the anatomy of a hack. And today uh, we are very thankful for the support and partnership and sponsorship of Rocket IT. And before we introduce Eric Henderson uh, with Rocket IT, I want to go through a few housekeeping rules first. Uh, know that the chat feature and the Q&A feature will be enabled for today's uh, webinar and will be monitored both by Partnership Gwinnett uh, staff, my colleagues here, as well as uh, Eric's colleagues from Rocket IT as well. For those of you that may not be aware or have knowledge of Partnership Gwinnett, we are the Economic and Community Development Initiative of the Gwinnett Chamber of Commerce. Our job is to recruit and retain and expand business in Gwinnett. One of our five target sectors is information technology. So we're very pleased today to focus on this particular issue, this particular challenge during a time of vulnerability across our systems. And very pleased to have the expertise and knowledge of Eric Henderson, who is the Vice President of Technology at Rocket IT. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Eric and have him introduce himself and we'll carry on with the topic, Eric. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Henderson, as Adam mentioned, uh, Vice President of Technology at Rocket IT. Uh, Rocket IT is a IT services firm in Suwannee, Georgia. Uh, our purpose is to help people thrive. And so we have worked very closely with the Gwinnett Chamber of Commerce and then Partnership Gwinnett in particular over the last 10, 15, 20 years. And we have a, kind of an interesting presentation today. Uh, this is going to be very interactive. So. I am joined by Colleen Frangos. Uh, she's not sharing her screen right now, but she will be helping me with uh, the polling. At various points in this presentation, uh, I'm going to ask you a question, and there will be a multiple choice selection of what you think the answer is. And so don't overthink it, just uh, whichever one you think comes to mind that is most likely the answer to what the question is. Uh, we're going to talk through it, and I'm I'm very interested to find out, uh, you know, where you guys land on 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 these questions. So uh, let me get display going here. Okay, today we're going to be talking about the anatomy of a hack, what it takes to stop a threat. So many cybersecurity presentations are very theoretical, so they're just talking about. What does Eric think is best to stop a hack? They're not based in any sort of specific event. And what I have learned, and I think what my colleagues at Rocket IT have learned, is that because the environment for cybersecurity is changing so, so rapidly, uh, we have to learn from things that have actually happened. We have to learn from people in our community. So Rocket IT is a member of a number of peer groups, and the the motto of almost all of these groups is, hey, if something, if, some, if you hear about something, tell us what happened. You know, distill it down to three things that you learn from this event and share that with your peers. And so that's what we're doing today. Uh, this isn't, you know, an IT company to another IT company. This is an IT company to members of, uh, of the chamber and then people that work uh, closely with Partnership Gwinnett. And so uh, let's, uh, let's get started here. So we're going to talk about four main things today, uh, how to identify a threat, how to mitigate the success rate of attack, what to do if an attack makes it through, and then how to prevent future attacks from occurring. Uh, in many areas of my life, and certainly in the area of IT security, we take kind of a con consistently evolving, evolving approach. So we say, okay, we've got a set of technology standards. They're working fine. Oh, okay. Something happens. All right. Well, what do we do about that? How do we adapt to that? What do we learn from that event? How can we improve to make it a little bit better? And so that's that's the whole model for today. All the questions we're going to ask you and everything we're talking about is built on on, on that particular idea. So uh, quote here: "Those who uh, cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it." And the world is proving this true. You know, uh, very heavily when it comes to IT security right now. There was news earlier this week that the Honda Corporation, as in 
Honda that makes automobiles, Honda that has a massive customer service division that has a massive financing team, uh, was hit with a cyber security attack and or a cyber um, breach. And they are very quiet on exactly what happened, but they had to stop production. And if the attack was bad enough that it stopped production, it had to hit some very, very critical systems to Honda's operation. And so they're not the first manufacturer to get hit. They're not going to be the last. The best we can possibly hope to do is just learn from what happened to them and then what happened from you know, people even uh, much smaller and closer than that. So we're going to do a case study today. Um, this is a event that actually happened. This is an event that I uh, was personally involved in helping with the remediation on. We probably spent three or 400 uh, hours of labor in about three weeks among a whole team of individuals handling uh, this, uh, this particular event for this, this organization. Uh, you can see some facts about them. They're in Gwinnett County, 450 plus employees, $80 million a year in annual revenue when this event occurred. It was a single attack and the uh, total cost estimated was uh, around $1 million in both lost time, stress, cost related to the attack. Uh, so here we go. Question number one. Uh, Colleen is going to uh, enable a poll and you will have the choice to vote which of you, which of these three things you think uh, cause the particular problem. All right, Eric, we're getting in some answers. I'll give you guys just yeah, a few, getting, getting. few seconds here. All right. Okay, a few more. All right, looks like we're slowing down. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, end the polling here, okay? Sure. Okay, well. Okay. Thank you, Eric. So, <laughs> uh, I, what do these people need me for? They already know the answer. Like it's an overwhelmingly strong response. Uh, I, I, I am aware that there are a couple people from Rocket IT in the audience, so I do feel like they might be skewing the results because they know they, they, they know that this happened. So okay, three options were on the table, right? Uh, fraudulent email. So fraudulent email would be a phishing email. It would be some sort of attack. Uh, too many permissions. You might think, oh, well, why would it be too many permissions? Well, some of the largest breaches that have happened, the one that hit uh, Experian, the credit reporting agency, was because they had a database of an entire country's worth of people's financial information. And that database was just sitting open on the web. So as silly as that sounds, it happens all the time. And then the third option, uh, and this is one that doesn't get as much attention, but we're going to talk a little bit about today, is an insider threat. So that means someone inside the organization, either because they're disgruntled or they only got a job there to attack their employer or they were paid off, not sure, did something. So uh, you guys voted fraudulent email. That is, in fact, the correct answer. Uh, Let's talk about how that happened and, and what happened with that. So uh, another word for a fraudulent email would be phishing, uh, phishing with a PH. I'm going to guess based on the popular usage of this word over the last couple of years that most of you know what this is. Uh, I don't know exactly why it's spelled with a PH. I think that's just uh, people on the internet like weird phraseology. So let's talk about what happened here specifically. So an email came in. Uh, the spam filter did not catch it. Uh, the email was opened by a specific employee. Uh, worse than opening the email, there was a Word document attached to the email and the employee thought the Word document was real. And because all the little prompts that Windows throws up at users are generally ignored. 
the user clicked the button that said disable protected view. So if you open an attachment from an email, across the top of Word, there's a little yellow bar that says this document is open in a protected view. You won't be able to edit it, save it, change it, print it, any of that. And you have probably clicked on that bar hundreds and hundreds of times and probably only read it two, five, ten of those times. And that bar is actually trying to protect you. And that bar was kind of the last line of defense. And the user elected to click the disable protected view. Uh, they, they elected to click disable protected view, which would allow the document to be open fully and to be trusted. Uh, when the document was open, it launched a script. All a script is is just a little snippet of code that does something. So if you think about your home automation system and you say, Alexa, turn the lights on or Alexa, turn the lights off, all that is doing is just running a script that says, this light, run this command on it. That's the same thing that happened. Somebody had embedded a script inside of a Word document, which is a feature that's supposed to be used for good. It can do all sorts of cool things, but generally speaking, uh, it is most often used for evil. And so that installed a virus on a single computer, uh, which we'll talk a lot more about. So uh, what this virus did was three things. I uh, think the first one was install a keylogger. What is a keylogger? Keylogger is a piece of software that remembers everything that you type. So if you type in a password, if you type in a, uh, a angry email, if you type in some sort of pin that you use with your bank, it just keeps a record of anything that you type. And at the time, it was very surprising because one of our engineers was troubleshooting on one of the computers. And they tried to copy something so that they could paste it, like they copied some text and then they took it over to another place to paste it. Well, their copy didn't work, so they just pasted whatever was pasted last. And what was on the clipboard was a full log of everything the user had typed for several hours. Uh, so just one line every time there was a gap. And so it would say like the user's name and then it would say a password. And the password wasn't those little dots or asterisks, it was the actual password. And if they typed an email or they typed an email address, it just said this, 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 this. Uh, the second thing that the attack did is it spread across the network. So it looked for other computers on the network and attempted to install itself on each of those computers. And the third thing it did was crack the local password data. So you've probably heard, and we'll talk about it here, hey, you need longer or more complex passwords. And I think what most non-technical users hear when they say that is, you want your password to be hard to guess. But that's not really the problem. People aren't really worried about someone just guessing what your password is. Uh, there's just too many combinations of letters and numbers that it could possibly be. It's very unlikely someone would get it exactly right. What they're worried about is this type of attack because the shorter your password is, the uh, state of computer technology is it's not terribly difficult to break that password wide open if it's short. So if your password's six letters, no numbers, no symbols, uh, no uppercase letters, then a computer can crack that password in less than a couple minutes. And so if the password was 25 characters or 16 characters, it could take years or tens of years or hundreds of years, at least with the current state of technology. Okay. Okay. Uh, so poll number two, how long did it take for the virus to accomplish everything I just said? So get on the computer, crack the things in the local user, spread across the network. You know, Colleen, we could have we could have some fun banter here. What what's your guess? Ooh, challenge. Well, I, should I go with majority here? What? <laughs> seems seems safe. I don't, I, I don't know. I'm going to go with the majority. I think folks know just as well as uh, I do. Seems like a safe bet. All right, Eric. I, I think most. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. This is, uh, we got to make these questions harder. We're going to have to. I mean, Erica, I'm not going to embarrass myself. The... <laughs> All uh, right. Let's end the polling here, guys. All right. I'm going to share the results and look at that. Yeah. So you're right. It's four hours. Okay. Uh, it might have actually been less than that. Uh, four hours is when uh, when we went back and tracked the times and dates. That's that's how long it became clear that this took. So, yeah, that's that's not very long. Uh, that's almost instantly, right? It's pretty close to just as fast as it possibly could happen. So. What happened? One user inspected 180 devices. Two days later, uh, three individuals had their personal finances uh, breached. So what does that mean? Uh, that means if I have a computer that I use at work and just out of convenience sake, I occasionally go to Amazon and place personal orders or I go to Wells Fargo or Bank of America or any other bank and I type in my credentials and there was a keylogger on my computer. Well, not only is the business I work for breached, my personal accounts are also breached at this point. So um, there's a lot more we could say about that. Uh, I think the, the world is not ready to accept this yet, but setting policies that would say that employees should not access personal websites on their work computers isn't unreasonable. Uh, it certainly would have prevented this particular attack in this case. Um, it leads to all sorts of interesting problems and complaints when an employee's personal accounts are breached because of the actions of a different employee. And the, you know, the security did not, did not prevent that. So um, not the focus of today. So, Yep. So they found uh, individuals using business computers for personal tasks. They uh, waited for a user to type in their credit card number or have the credit card number automatically fill in, which is a convenience. And then, and this is probably the worst part, and we've actually seen this several other times. It's called an email bomb attack. Uh, you know how if you were to go on Amazon.com and change your password, Amazon is going to send you an email that says, hey, just letting you know, your password changed. Probably no big deal if you chose to change your password. Uh, if you didn't mean to change your password, that's a big problem because that means someone's in your account. So Amazon's intention in sending you this email is that if you see the email and you're not sitting in a computer and someone changes your Amazon account, you need to take action immediately because the number of services that are tied to Amazon at this part, point and the number of things that you can purchase and all of that has huge implications into your financial security, your personal security. So what the attackers did is when they selected a person that, that they wanted to breach, they decided to send that person tens and thousands, tens and tens of thousands of emails as rapidly as possible. And the intention is not just to be annoying, the intention is to divert that person's attention from any one email. It's very difficult to see the email that says your Amazon password changed when uh, you're getting thousands of other emails an hour. And so when this type of attack happens, kind of the, the opportunity here is every couple hours, you have to search the word password, transfer, financial, new card, credit card, any sort of thing that might appear in one of those emails. If you, if you think about those emails, like if, if your bank sends you a new credit card, they're going to send you an email that says, hey, just letting you know, a new credit card's on the way. And the reason for that is that old school identity theft was you go on the bank, you change the person's address, and then you request a new card. And then the card comes in and you have full access to a card that is valid that went to the wrong address. And so, uh, you know, one of the things we learned in this event is, that's the purpose of that type of email spam. And your best case scenario is to go in and prevent that by doing searches for the words that might appear in that. Um, okay. Next question, how long does it take to recover from an attack of this size? 
All right, got the poll up. Okay, if I've learned anything from this style of questions, we're gonna make these questions like 50 times harder, Colleen. <laughs> hey. <laughs> so no. I mean, I know we can't see the response hours. yet, but <laughs> yeah. Hmm. That's very hopeful, right? That you'd have this all done in a day. Yeah, I mean, I'm an optimist, right? So, <laughs> oh wait, we got one. <laughs> I, I think they're responding to our banter. I think that's yep. what happened here, Colin. Most likely, challenge, I like it. All right, well, I, I think we've got, uh, anybody else? Yeah. No? Share all it right. out. Let's, let's end the polling. Let's, let's see these results here. All right. Okay. So 70% at four weeks, 4% at four hours, and 26% at four days. Uh, once again, the, uh, the, the group is correct. The, the majority, I should say, is correct. Uh, four weeks was the time. And arguably, it took much longer than that. And the reason for that is when something like this hits your network, you have a pendulum, right? And it swings back and forth between convenience over here and very secure, but very inconvenient over here. And so to get the organization operational, let's say the, you know, the pendulum was very balanced between convenience and security. They swung the pendulum so far over this direction because they had to be sure that they're sure that they're sure that the network, network was operational. But I'm sure you've had the experience of working at an organization and the IT person comes around and says, we're going to put this new software on your computer. We're going to make you type in this new code. We're going to make your password 25 characters. We're going to make it so that you can only log in between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. We're going to make it so you can only log in from the office. We're going to restrict access to this. We're going to put a web filter in place, whatever. It doesn't matter which of those things it is. Many of those things deeply hampen, uh, hamper employees' uh, productivity. And so uh, the, the recovery time is actually substantially longer. So uh, as noted for these four weeks, uh, a whole bunch of stuff had to be done. Uh, we didn't actually use fire extinguishers. There was no actual literal fire on the servers, uh, but it certainly felt that way. So uh, a large number of computers needed wiping and reloading. So. The nature of this attack was, and the nature of a keylogger is that it's extraordinarily difficult to tell if that is then completely wiped off of the computer and the network. It's very, very, very hard to tell if you've actually gotten everything. The, the only way you really know is if some amount of time goes by such that another attack does not happen. Uh, secondly, and this is something this client uh, did have in place, they, they had strong backups. So. When I say strong backups, I don't mean there's a USB drive that's plugged into the servers and every so often they make a copy of it. They had backups that were on a completely separate network that went off-site that were completely away from the network. So what makes this, this type of attack scary is if I put my mind in, in, in the place of someone who's perpetrating one of these attacks, I'm generally looking to do three or four things. I want to get in the network quietly. I want to figure out where all the data is and all the backups are. And then I want to launch the attack in such a way that it's going to be very difficult for the uh, business to recover from it without paying me some sort of ransom. And so they are always focused on how do I get in? How do I stay in? How do I make sure I have all the rights that I need to do that? Where's the data? And then how do I lock it down? Uh, in this particular attack, they didn't do it. There was no encryption. There wasn't any ransomware. This was just about trying to gain access to the network. I think it got cut off faster than they really expected. And then, as I mentioned about, you know, security versus convenience, a variety of new company-wide security policies were put in place as a result of, the, of this particular event. Um, okay, so... That is the summary about that particular event. I want to talk about kind of our collective wisdom that we've gained from this event and a huge number of other events. Uh, 
A relatively common story in the rocket IT world is we get a frantic phone call from a business owner or a manager that says, oh my gosh, my network had XYZ happen to it. And either I don't have an IT person, I don't have an IT company I work with, my IT person resigned and I'm worried about their level of access. Uh, or worse than that, I have one of those things and it's been two weeks and we're still suffering. We're still completely locked down. We don't have any sort of access. And so uh, that's kind of our, that's, that's our moment to be a hero. That's about as important of work as we ever can get because it's very time sensitive and there's a lot of stress and a lot of pain that, that, that comes from that. And so from handling those types of events and from handling the event that I just described through that case study, here's, uh, here's kind of our key takeaways. I'm gonna try and make these as accessible as accessible as possible so that you can take these back to your organizations and really be able to use them uh, for, for, your own, for your own game. Okay, uh, I could speak, I could, we could go a whole hour on this slide, but the point is, way back in the day, 10 years, 20 years ago, all you had to do to do security was these four things, firewall, backup, spam filter, and antivirus. And everyone agreed in the IT industry, as long as you have a good firewall, good backup, good antivirus, good spam filter, kind of got the magic square, these four things to, to protect you, you're good. And what, what has happened since then is that Attackers used to attack the blinky boxes in the server room. They went after servers and firewalls and websites, right? All these hacks were always, oh, a deficiency was found in this one program, and this hacker figured out that if you do this, this, this exactly right, then it just lets you have administrative access. Well, since 2013, the style has shifted, and now people aren't really trying to do that. It's too much work. There's armies of people that are focused on preventing people from getting into that. So what they've decided to do instead is attack people. And it's very smart. It's evil, but it's also very smart. People are naturally trusting uh, a segment of the population. If they get an email, no matter what it says, they, they just assume it's true. And I think that's generally because they're good natured, good people. Like they they can never themselves imagine trying to trick somebody into surrendering their financial information so they have a hard time just being vigilant around assuming that if i get an email it must be fake and so we've met with hundreds of companies and i've brought up this point hundreds of times and every single time the company says well you know we sent an email out about three months ago about that saying don't click on emails and people don't really bring them to me very often so i don't think people are clicking on phishing email. And the problem with that is when you click an actual phishing email, most of the time, what happens isn't what I just talked about in the last 20 minutes. It's not this disaster, you know, apocalyptic style problem for that organization. That's not, that's not the normal thing that happens. Most of the time, either the attack gets blocked by some device or uh, it was successful and you just don't even know it yet. So a lot of security companies would say you need to act at all moments as if you're already breached. I'm not sure I'm quite that uh, despairing of life. But the point is, if I click a phishing email, there's no instant feedback to tell me I did something wrong, right? So if I touch a hot stove, I know instantly through pain that that was the wrong thing to do. In a phishing email, your employees have no idea that they've done something wrong unless they can trace it back to this point. And so what we do, based on this slide, is phishing testing. So we send out a fake email that has a link in it that looks like a real attack. And if the user clicks on it, nothing bad happens to them. But the system records that they clicked the email and then they became a clicker. And you don't wanna be a clicker. Um, so that gives us the data to say, well, you know, actually, 22% of the time, your employees click these emails, and you have one employee that just clicks every single one of the emails that we send them. And they don't even know they're doing anything wrong, so there's no opportunity for change. If you don't 
understand your action is bad, you're not going to invest any time or effort in fixing it because you don't see it as a problem. And so if all you hear, this whole conversation is this one slide, implementing this is the as close to silver bullet as we get to reduce the risk of your organization getting breached. And there's lots of ways to do it. There's lots of firms that can assist with this. Um, Robin OT, as you might expect, has a variety of means to roll this type of system out. Uh, if you're not doing it, strongly recommend that you do it. And if you only do it once a year, it's really not enough. Uh, we are recommending at this point two emails a month to every employee. So every employee gets uh, sometime between eight and five on a two-week time basis. It's random for every employee. They get a random email. It's totally different from their peers. So it's not all the emails sitting at the same time. And we do pretty close reporting back to management to say, you know, we've tried to train this person and they keep clicking the emails. I think it's really time for you, business owner or CEO or manager, to have a direct conversation with them because one of these days they're going to click a real email and then something bad's actually going to happen. And you have the data here to know who's likely to do that based on the test. Um, and, uh, there, there's the fish. I guess the fish is the people clicking the phishing emails there. Okay, the second item, and as I go into this, uh, I understand that if you read the things on this slide and actually imagine doing them for yourself, it's roughly like going to the dentist and the dental hygienist saying, you know, Eric, you really need to floss twice a day, like at least once a day. And you just say, yeah, yeah, I, I know, I know, I need, I need to floss. And then most people don't do it. I don't know what the statistics are. I wish I did. Um, I hope they're higher than I think they are. But the point of this slide is if you imagine that keylogger attack where they got a hold of a user's password. Let's say the password was elephant123. That's not any of my passwords. Don't, don't bother trying. It's not the password. And I use that password for my Amazon account, my bank, my utilities, my Gmail, and Facebook. But I only use Amazon on my work computer. Let's say I go to Amazon, I type in my email address, I type in elephant123. They get a copy of that password because they have software on my computer that logged it. The next thing they're going to do is they're gonna to go to google.com on their computer, they're gonna type in my email address, and they're gonna type in elephant123 and see if it works on that site. And then they're going to try the top five most popular banks in the United States. And then they're going to try the most popular shopping sites. They're going to try all the email providers. And by having the same password in multiple places, you are multiplying your risk. Because if that password breaches in any one of those places, all of those accounts are breached simultaneously. The second thing, I already spoke about this, is password length. Uh, I think our industry has done a bad job in the past on this. We tried to convince users that a password that was hard for humans to remember, like eight asterisk, lowercase u, uppercase p, one, seven, exclamation, something like that is a good password. It's not. It's a bad password for a variety of reasons. It's a bad password because users write it down, which is just increasing the risk. It's a bad password because it's hard to remember. So it's going to frustrate the user and it's going to frustrate the IT administrators that serve that particular user. And probably worst of all, it's not that hard for a computer to guess if it's only six or eight characters. So the guidance in the last five years is basically we need to move to passphrases. We need to move basically past this random short password system because it's only hurting us. It's only making life worse. It's not actually uh, solving anything. So uh, we, uh, we advocate for passphrases. We're looking for 16 to 25 characters. This slide says 16 characters. If I thought we could get away with it, we would say 25 characters. But people are so used to passwords being 6, 8, 10 characters long. We're trying to gradually ease them into much longer passwords. Um, so you might be thinking at this point, OK, Eric, you want longer passwords. You want them to be phrases and you want them to be different on every single site that I have. How in the world am I possibly going to remember that? Uh, it's a good, pro good point. Uh, and I'm not saying the world is completely 
in consensus on this, but our guidance is you use a password manager. Basically, you use a system that keeps track of all those passwords, and then you only remember the key to the vault. And as long as you don't use that key to the vault anywhere that's insecure, and as long as you write it down and keep it somewhere safe, or you memorize it perfectly, then everything in the vault uh, will be fine. And so this is how we manage passwords at Rocket IT. This is how I manage my passwords personally. Um, there are trade-offs in all of the different methods of doing this. It, it's interesting, having a written piece of paper that has passwords that are all different for all your sites kept somewhere in your home that's very safe, arguably is more secure than what I'm describing, but it's entirely inconvenient. And so most users aren't willing to put up with that inconvenience. The final thing over here on the left, uh, two-factor authentication. So what is that? A factor of authentication is a fancy way of saying, how do you prove you are who you say you are? So if I go to the bank, I can't just tell them my name is Eric Henderson, right? I have to produce some sort of proof through either my pen, my driver's license, my debit card, something along those lines to prove I am who I say I am. Each of those things, so the pen, my banking password, my driver's license, my debit card, each of those is a factor of authentication. And security always goes up as you add factors of authentication. Right now, most websites just require a username and a password, which is a set of credentials. That is one factor of authentication, and it's also really easy to break into, because as long as you know the password and the username, you're in. The most common second form of authentication is usually something related to your phone. So either it sends you a text message that says, type in this text message, you've got you know, 20 seconds to fill it in, or you have a little app on your phone and every 30 seconds it puts up a new code and you have to time that code in and make sure you type it in at the right time. Uh, the text message is, I think that's going to fade away. Um, hackers have caught on to this, and some of the most famous attacks, particularly around cryptocurrency lately, have shown that the hackers will go to the Verizon store, pretend to be you, get a SIM card, which is you know the the record of whose phone, which phone should the carrier send text messages to, and then a time of their choosing, they get the user's password, they put the SIM card in a phone, they type the password in. It sends a text message to the phone, but the problem is they went to Verizon and switched which phone it is. So they get the text message that was meant for me or who they're attacking, and they breach the account. And so several million dollars, there was a, there was a complaint filed, I think, in New York uh, that a cryptocurrency investor lost seven digits and was suing a 18-year-old that perpetrated this attack against him. So the text message thing isn't great. I will tell you that some of the world's largest companies are relying on the text message thing. I think because then in a rush to get this pushed out, they tried to make it as user-friendly as possible. And it's way more user-friendly to receive a text than it is to have an app and a whole system for doing this. All I would say to you is, even if you have the text message system, it is still super more secure than just having the password. It'd be better if you had, it's, it's called TOTP, it's uh, one time, you know, what's it called? Time based, one time password, I think. And basically, that is the gold standard right now in terms of this type of stuff. But just having any second factor of authentication is wonderful. Just getting from one, which is a username and password, to two, something with your phone would be great. Okay. Uh, I won't spend too long here, but. Antivirus in the past works the same as antibodies in your back, in your body. So the way antibodies in your like immune system work is if they've seen a virus or a bacteria before, they know what it is and they kill it. So that's how antivirus was modeled, which is fascinating that humans made software that works the same as our immune system. The problem with this is that many of these attacks have never been used before. So it's kind of the same as a new pathogen. Uh, much, has been, much ink has been spilled about how this is basically why the coronavirus was labeled as novel. 
it's because our immune systems have never encountered some, most of us have never had our immune systems encounter anything like this before. So the antivirus companies picked up on the fact that it's way easier to write viruses now. This worked great 10 years ago. And now what they do is they monitor what your computer is actually doing and watch for bad behavior. So if we go back to our case study, the person opened a Word document and launched a script. Is this employee someone who normally would launch Word documents that have scripts attached to it? The answer is no. Almost no one does that. There's almost no legitimate reason that an end user working in a, some portion of a, of a business would ever run a script. Uh, most users don't know what it is. Most users wouldn't even know where to start, and they wouldn't even be able to come up with a valid reason. So what the antivirus products do now, and this is relatively new, is they watch for scripts being run, and they say, oh, I don't know if this script's legitimate or not, but we're blocking it because this is not a normal user behavior. I don't care if I've ever seen the virus. I don't care if my antibodies of my computer have seen it before. It does not matter. And so um, th this is sometimes called endpoint detection and response. You'll see it uh, acronymed to EDR. Uh, you can see the, the words up there at the top. Okay. Now. That is the end of our presentation. Uh, thank you so much for participating in our poll. I noticed at various points through the conversation, there's been some questions. And so uh, Colleen has been gathering those questions. And so now we'll have a, a conversation around them. Awesome. Well, Eric, I've got uh, two questions that were over in the chat. So I'm, I'm gonna start there and weave my way into our other questions we got. Um, I got a question from Ace and he is wondering, uh, the company that we that you pointed out in the presentation, uh, do they have an internal cybersecurity awareness training in house? Did they or do they? Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with do they based on how he phrased it, but I, I assume they didn't have one. <laughs> that that's right. So this attack actually happened a couple of years ago. This is not something in the last one or two years or something. I don't know exactly what year it was. All kind of runs together. But the answer was prior to this attack, no. They did not have a uh, focused cybersecurity program. And the it's kind of the same as you you know you don't think you need a type of insurance until you have an event that would pay out a claim on that type of insurance. Um, one of the purposes of this whole presentation is just to say if you've ever gotten a phishing email and it has an attachment, this could have been you. That's that's not far-fetched to say. This happened to an organization within Gwinnett County. I, I realize not every attendee here is in Gwinnett County, but they probably generally work for small businesses. And so this is something that could totally happen. And I totally agree that a security awareness program, I, mean, I know they have one now, uh, would have gone a long way to potentially prevent this. Great. Thank you, Eric. All right. We've got another one here. Um, so Layla is asking, what if the employees are using incognito mode for personal use? Sure. I'm guessing it's on a, a yeah. work machine. Yeah. So incognito mode is a function that was popularized by the Google Chrome browser. Um, it I don't know if it promises this, it probably doesn't promise this, but the idea is that most users believe that by using incognito mode that your actions are in fact incognito. And as in, no one knows about it, there's no tracking done on it whatsoever. Uh, the reality is it almost does nothing. All that it really does is makes it so whatever website you went to, Google search history doesn't keep a record of that, and your web browser doesn't recommend that website as a site you've been to. So if you go to facebook.com on Chrome, and then you, on another day, come back to Google and type FA, at the beginning of Facebook, it'll say, oh, you went to Facebook, that's great. We know you like Facebook, you can go back to Facebook whenever you want. All it's doing is preventing this being saved formally in your Google record and auto filling in when you go to that website in the future. Uh, so as far as attacks go, attackers don't care about that at all. That is a Google specific thing. And worse than that, your corporate network still has a record that you went to that website. 
your internet service provider still has a record that you went to the website. That website still has a record that it came from you. And if you log in, I mean, you're just as logged in as you are anywhere else. The purpose of incognito mode is really around, uh, I mean, it, it serves two functions. Basically, if you have some reason you don't want your web traffic to be saved into your Google profile, that's great. And then IT people use it when, if you know how you go to a website and it automatically logs you in, if you don't want that to happen, like you have some reason you want to use a different account, it works very good for that because it assumes you've never been there before. Great. Thanks, Eric. All right, got another question. Uh, what is the safest way to do online banking? Sure. Uh, well, as noted earlier in the presentation, the far and away safest thing to do is to not do online banking on a work computer, unless it's obviously your work, uh, you know, the, the corporate bank account. Uh, you are assuming that your IT provider at your work is doing a great job of protecting the network and you're assuming all of your coworkers don't click phishing emails. And while those are hopeful, I would say, assumptions, they are not definitely true. So basically you want to do online banking in a network that you have as much control over as possible. And that doesn't mean you have to be an IT genius. If you have a computer at your home and one of the computers is logged into by children, teenagers, etc., people that may not know the exact rules of IT security and might try and download movies for free or video games for free or might try and use BitTorrent and download something that they shouldn't. And then you have another computer that you only use and you only use it to go to these four websites and you only use it to use Microsoft Word and you don't check your work email on it. That computer far and away is a better option. Even better than that, and I know this is weird, but this is just the state of the world. If you have an iPhone, there have been no known situations that I'm aware of ever in which an app on the iPhone has been breached by another app. Uh, the way the iPhone is set up is very different than on Android phones. iPhone apps do not interact with each other. So if I made it on the app, it would be incredibly difficult. And the Wells Fargo, this app has no ability to interact with the Wells Fargo app. And so my traffic is protected. The other thing I would say is where you're connecting from matters. So generally you want to connect from your home, not from say a coffee shop. Though that example isn't great. Uh, I generally believe that Starbucks and Google have properly secured the Wi-Fi network at a Starbucks. If it's a kind of small mom and pop place, you know, maybe they did, maybe they didn't. I wouldn't, I would trust with my information. Nice. All right. All right. Well, Eric, we're getting in a lot of good questions. So I hope we have time to hit most of these. Uh, next All one. right. I'm All right. Go fast. We have five minutes, so I'll be, okay. I'll be faster. <laughs> Is it typical to see an attack like this? hit smaller businesses or are multiple large organizations? It's a good one. Uh, the attacks that get reported are the large organizations, but there's something like 1,300 or 1,700 cyber attacks last year, which is ridiculous because there's actually been tens of thousands of them. The small ones just don't have to be reported to anyone, so there's no statistics. I don't think the, the attackers are targeting, most of them aren't targeting anything. They're just spraying attacks across the entire network. If they get a list of email addresses, it's just as easy to spam 50, you know, Fortune 500 companies as it is to spam 10,000 small businesses. It costs no difference to attack small number versus large. So they're just casting as wide of a net as they possibly can. I think, uh, I, I don't have an opinion on whether it's easier to breach a smaller or larger organization. It's probably easier and harder in different ways for both of them. I, I would guess just because the number of small businesses is extreme compared to the number of small businesses, or compared to the number of large businesses, that small businesses are getting hit tremendously more often. Wow. Great, thanks, Eric. All right, next question. If a member of my team starts getting spammed by individuals potentially trying to cover up a crime, yep. what action should I take to stop the spam from occurring? Sure. 
Uh, so the first thing is there is a uh, anti-spam technology called DMARC. That's D M A R K. Uh, sorry, D M A R C. Uh, it's also called D K I M, domain keys. Implementing this will block a decent portion of it. Additionally, if you're on Office 365. There are features in Office 365 that can block all emails that have non-English characters. So if you don't do business in any country that speaks a language that uses a different character set, so you know, Russia, China, Japan, et cetera, you can block all of the any email that has any letters in Cyrillic or Korean or Chinese. Um, third, and uh, a member of Rocket he actually help, helped us with this recently, uh, Chris, who put together this presentation and is, is in the audience. Um, often they use services like MailChimp to mass enroll in an a email address in as many newsletters as they can find. And MailChimp doesn't want that either. That's fraudulent use of their system. So if you contact MailChimp and say, hey, this email address is just, just got enrolled in 1,500 newsletters in five minutes, can you remove them? Can you mass remove them? They'll happily do that. That's great. Awesome. Okay. All right. Got another one for you. This is from John. All right. Before calling Rocket IT, what steps does one need to take right away? <laughs> Thanks, John. Nice plug. <laughs> that, that, that's great. Uh, we got some plants in the audience, apparently. Uh, <laughs> no. The far and away, the most important thing that you can do is. Start treating this topic like it's already happened to you. Basically, begin to believe that at this moment, right now, today, Thursday, there's someone on your network and they're just biding their time until they get a chance to do something to you. And if your IT provider, whether that's an employee or a firm, isn't taking a approach of vigilance and isn't taking a proactive approach, then you need to help them understand that that's really what you're looking for. And honestly, most IT people will find that very refreshing because they're, one of their chief complaints is that non-technical uh, leaders don't take this seriously enough. And the reason we can tell that is they don't give it the time of day or they don't invest in it as they should. And so if you just change the mindset there, that one step alone will lead to almost pretty much every IT person I talked to today would love to sit down and have a conversation around how to better secure the network. I can't give you a magic, just go do this. Uh, maybe the closest thing I could give you is for your most sensitive accounts, retirement accounts, investment accounts, banks, email, make the password different and see if you can enable two-pack authentication. That would take you a large percentage of the way down the road with 10 minutes of time. Absolutely. Thanks, Eric. All right. I, I like this question down here at the bottom again, uh, John. <laughs> He's asking for resources. So what websites or blogs sure. should one subscribe to in order to keep on top of cybersecurity threats? Sure. Uh, well, shameless plug. Uh, anytime there's a major event, Rocket IT is publishing to a blog, a newsletter, Facebook, Twitter, and I think LinkedIn, but certainly Facebook and uh, the newsletter anytime there's a major event. Uh, secondly, depending on how deep you want to go down the rabbit hole, there are a variety of publications that basically every major antivirus company has like a threat center. And so the one that I see pop up, pop up fairly often is called Sophos, S-O-P-H-O-S. They do a tremendous job at identifying threats and getting news out there as quickly as possible. Now, the issue here is that they're often writing to a technical audience, so you have to be a little careful with just getting snowed under with, uh, you know, an infinite number of security things that you can't tell if they're important and you can't know what to do uh, about it. Um, Colleen, I can see the questions. I'm going to grab a couple of them, okay? Ooh, okay, okay. Uh, John mentioned what two-factor authorization app do you recommend? Uh, the one we recommend is called Authy. That's A-U-T-H-Y. Uh, Authy is based on the Google authentication platform. And the key benefit that it has over the other ones that we've used 
is that if you get a new phone, you can transfer all of your two factor authentication systems over to the new phone without having to re-enroll all of them, which would be very frustrating. Uh, I've got a question here. What about work Wi-Fi on our mobile phone? How safe is it to use our bank apps on the work Wi-Fi? Um, assuming you're doing it from a mobile phone that actually is reasonably secure. The type of attack that it would take to steal your password in transit from your work Wi-Fi is fairly difficult to pull off. It is substantially better than using a Windows desktop at your workplace. If you have to do it at work, if you just, for whatever reason, that's where you, where you have to make those changes, strongly recommended to do it on a phone versus a computer. Um, all right, we're almost out of time. What did I miss? Are there downsides to whitelisting applications? Are those cons outweighed by the security it provides? Okay. It was on a slide, I didn't mention it. Application whitelisting, basically right now, if you ask your computer to install something, it installs it. it. It's a command and the computer respects the command and it doesn't. The problem with this is that users sometimes accidentally install the wrong thing. So there's a line of software called application whitelisting that says, well, we're not gonna say you can install whatever you want. We're gonna say you can only install this list of 10 applications and you make that list of 10 applications what your business uses. The benefit of this is that if something isn't on this list, it doesn't install, but that's also the drawback. Uh, users have a variety of use cases for installing things and application whitelisting software can be very, very annoying because it means if you want to change anything and someone hasn't explicitly allowed it before, the change doesn't happen. Um, but that said, we, uh, we, we still do it. I uh, got a question here. Do you suggest authentication by call? Uh, no. Okay, authentication by talk call is roughly the same as authentication by text message. Uh, it's in the same boat as text messaging. It is way better than nothing. It's very likely not to get breached, but there is a way to do it. And depending on if you get attacked, you know, that, that's an issue. Uh, another question, can a password manager be hacked? Okay, this is, this will be the last question. This is the hot button question. So if I put all my eggs, in one basket, basket, and that basket is my password manager vault, and somebody steals that, well, now I'm way worse off than if I didn't have a password manager, right? I've made it really easy. Here's my website, here's my username, here's my password. Here's my website, username, password. The technology that the password managing companies use, and there's trust involved in this, everything I'm about to say, but I trust them in this because I understand what the technology and the mindset is, that vault can only be unlocked by your password. The password manager company themselves can't open that vault. So if someone broke into the password manager company and stole the vault, that's okay because the password manager company couldn't open the vault themselves anyway. And as long as your password's 25 characters, the rules of encryption are that they wouldn't be able to ever break into that in any reasonable time. Now, on the flip side, if you get a keylogger on your computer, and they see you're using a password manager and you type in your password manager password for your vault on the Keylogs computer, well, you just literally gave them the key for every password that you have. And now you have to pretend that the entire thing is completely breached and wide open. So you are focusing the risk down into one place, but I think the benefits that you're getting from that outweigh the loss of uh, the, or I guess it outweighs the the potential pain that comes that can come from that okay um if you have other questions uh you are free to email those over i'm sure you can uh, reach out to adam you can reach out to lauren you can reach out to uh, andrew uh anyone on the partnership Gwinnett team and they will make sure to get those over to us back to you adam awesome thank you so very much eric and colleen for your expertise in particular uh, your witty banter is always appreciated. Uh, but what I particularly appreciate about Rocket IT is their human-centered approach. And you saw a lot of that today. It's like, uh, despite the tools, despite the technology, uh, this is a human challenge, our, our human behavior. And as Eric acknowledged earlier, a matter of trust that we as people who interact with technology have to afford. And with Rocket IT, that trust, that human-centered approach is deeply and sincerely appreciated. So we're thankful for you and your presence in our community and continue to lead 
and to inform and to educate. So thank you so much, Eric. Thank you, Colleen. Uh, thank you, Chris, uh, your colleague in the marketing department there, Rock. You're welcome. I'd like to say thanks to Lauren Como, my uh, uh, partner and colleague here at Partnership Grant, and Ken Rutherford from the chamber as well. For those of you on the other side, know that uh, we will follow up with a questionnaire. Appreciate your feedback and your insight into your experience on the other side of this webinar. You also receive a copy of the recording for future reference. And know that Partnership Gwinnett is here, again, to sustain, to support, and to encourage your growth as a business in our community. So whatever we can do for you on behalf of your organization, please do not hesitate to contact us at Partnership Gwinnett. And we're thankful for your time and your attention today. And we wish you all the best on this beautiful Thursday afternoon. So thanks again. Thanks to Rocket IT. And thank you all.